Welcome to Vox Oceanus. This month's episode will be focused on the Battle of Jutland. This is quite fitting since this episode is being uploaded on the 100th anniversary of said battle. This is based on a write-up that the owner of Vox Oceanus wrote and posted on the World of Warships forum back on the 1st of January of 2014. A link to the original post will be included in the description, just as a disclaimer for anybody who might think that there is a case of plagiarism. This is not the case, as I wrote that post. By the early summer of 1916, war had raged very visibly and destructively across the European continent for almost two years. On the seas, however, less seemed to have happened. Because of the dangers posed by torpedoes and mines, the Royal Navy had abandoned the age-old policy of close blockade in favor of a distant blockade designed to keep the German high seas fleet trapped in the North Sea. The Germans, on the other hand, had built their war plan around the assumption that the Royal Navy would impose a close blockade. The result was stalemate, and the Germans designing operations intended to catch a small portion of the Grand Fleet, the battle fleet of the Royal Navy, and destroy it. It was on one of these missions that the new leader of the High Seas Fleet, Admiral Reinhard Scheer, departed German ports on the early hours of the 31st of May, 1916. The plan Scheer initially developed for this operation was based around a bombardment of Sunderland by Vice Admiral Ritter Hipper's battle cruisers, with the intention of drawing out portions of the Grand Fleet based in Scapa Flow and the battle cruiser fleet based in Rosyth over a waiting line of U boats and then engaging the battle cruiser fleet with the entire High Seas Fleet before the Grand Fleet could reach the site of the battle. A crucial part of this plan was the use of aerial reconnaissance via zeppelins, but because of poor weather, these assets were not available. Not wanting to waste the U-boat ambush, one of the main points of the operation, and running out of time for the U-boats to remain on station, Scheer instead took the High Seas Fleet north towards the coast of Norway to the Skagerrak, hoping to provoke the British into sortieing and being attacked by the U-boats. The Grand Fleet, read by Admiral John Jellicoe, had already put the sea en masse the evening before the High Seas Fleet. The Grand Fleet had been warned of the impending German sortie and prepared a trap of its own in response. The source of this information was a section of the Admiralty known as Room 40, which had been set up at the beginning of the war to break German wireless codes. Through luck, they were able to obtain and by extension read all three of Germany's naval codes before the end of 1914. The information from Room 40 led to every major conflict in the North Sea during the Great War. At 12.48 on the 31st of May, however, a blunder was made by the Admiralty when a message was sent to Jellicoe stating that the High Seas Fleet was still in the Jade, implying that only Hipper's battle cruisers were at sea. When the High Seas Fleet was spotted later that day, the result was an erosion of the confidence in the information from the Admiralty. By 2.40 on the afternoon of the 31st of May, both battle cruisers forces spotted a plume of smoke and sent light cruisers to investigate. The cause of the smoke was a Danish freighter, but this caused both sides to come into contact with each other. In response, Vice Admiral David Beatty, the dashing and impetuous commander of the British battle cruiser fleet, turned his fleet from its northerly course to the southeast to cut off the German ships from their bases, even before knowing the extent of the forces opposing him. In doing so, however, he left behind the four powerful Queen Elizabeth-class battleships of the 5th Battle Squadron behind because of a signaling error, robbing him of one of his chief advantages over the German battle cruisers. It is also curious that Beatty, who favored a more tally-ho, follow-me style of leadership, had not talked with his new subordinate, Rear Admiral Hugh Evan Thomas about how things were done in the battlecruiser fleet, especially since e Evan Thomas was accustomed to Jellicoe's more centralized style of command. As a result, the 5th Battle Squadron ended up falling almost 10 miles behind Beatty's battlecruiser before finally receiving the order to come about. At 1548, 
Both sides, Kipper and BT, opened fire at each other. The range was about 16,000 yards, but the gunnery conditions favored the Germans, as the sun was behind the British and the light gray of the Germans' hulls helped them blend into the horizon behind them. In addition, the wind blew the smoke of the British guns into their own line of fire, further hampering their gunnery. These conditions may well have played into the reason that BT failed to take advantage of the greater range of the British 13.5-inch gun. The British kept battlecruisers outnumbered their opponents 5 to 6, but there were mistakes made in the fire distribution. The two leading British ships, the Lion and the Princess Royal, engaged the Lutzau, while the Queen Mary, instead of engaging the Durflinger as she was supposed to, opened fire on the Sadlings, leaving the Durflinger, a well-drilled gunnery ship, undisturbed. The Tiger and the New Zealand concentrated on the Moltke, and the, at the end of the line, the Indefatigable and the Von der Tann fought their own private duel. Very quickly, the Germans began to score hits, while the British Bells sailed far beyond the German line. Finally, at 1555, the Queen Mary scored the first hits for the British, knocking out a turret on the Sadlitz at a range of 13,000 yards. At 1600 hours, however, the Lion suffered a potentially fatal blow. A 12 inch shell from Lutzau hit her Q turret, igniting the stored power charges and killing most of the turret crew. Not for the mortally wounded commander of the turret, Major Francis Harvey of the Royal Marines, ordering the magazine flooded, the line would have been sunk then and there. For this act, Harvey was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. Meanwhile, at the back of the line, the duel between the Indefatigable and the Von der Tan came to an end. A salvo from the Von der Tan hit the Indefatigable, sending her to the bottom in a single massive explosion taking with her all but two of her crew of 1,019 officers and men. At the same time, the 5th Battle Squadron had finally closed the gap and started to bring the dreadful power of their 32 15-inch guns to bear on the two rearmost ships of the German line. At 1615, Beatty ordered his destroyers to launch a torpedo attack on the German line, which hit or accounted with his own destroyers, resulting in a high-speed melee between the lines. And in the Seidlitz, being torpedoed, though her defenses held and she was able to maintain speed. At 1643, the attack was called off by BT after each side had lost two destroyers. Suddenly, at 1626, disaster struck BT's beleaguered force again. First, the Queen Mary exploded, and then the Princess Royal, disappearing behind a hail of shell splashes, was reported to have blown up prompting BT to comment to his flag captain that there seems to be something wrong with our bloody ships today. At 1638, BT's light cruisers, under the command of Commodore William Goodenough, sighted the high sea fleet, sending the reports to both Jellico and BT. BT continued to make sight of the force himself and then turned in succession to starboard, just out of the gunnery range of the high sea fleet. BT then began to run back north towards Jellicoe and the Grand Fleet. Then, faulty signaling again reared its ugly head. Once again, the 5th Battle Squadron did not receive the order to change course until it was almost too late, leaving the four most powerful battleships in the Royal Navy unsupported and running from the entire German Navy. In this section of the battle, the 5th Battle Squadron shot well and was heavily engaged with the most powerful units of the German fleet for an hour and 20 minutes in what has become known as the Run to the North. At 1605, Jellicoe had ordered the 3rd Battlecruiser Squadron, which had transferred to Scapa Flow for gunnery practice, and the reason that the 5th Battle Squadron was, was beady, to move to reinforce the Battlecruiser fleet. There had been a slight problem of incorrect coordinates being given, however, and the 3rd Battle Cruiser Squadron, under Rear Admiral Horace Hood in the Invincible, went too far to the east. At 1530, Hood was to the east of Hipper's Battle Cruisers, all of which were heavily damaged. The Von der Tan, for example, was no longer a fighting unit in any sense of the word, as all of her main guns had been silenced, and the others had not fared much better. At 1535, one of the screening cruisers of the 3rd Battlecruiser Squadron, the Chester, ran into the German 2nd Scouting Group of four light cruisers, including the Wiesbaden. The Chester was heavily damaged and fell back towards Hood's ships. 
Another victorious cross was won posthumously there by Jack Cornwall, a boy of 16 years of age who stayed at his gun awaiting orders even after the entire crew was killed or wounded. The third battlecruiser squadron then swooped down upon the German cruisers, disabling the Wiesbaden and driving off the others, saving the Chester. A vigorous attack by four accompanying destroyers drove off a much stronger German destroyer force and helped convince Hipper that there was a major force to his east, causing him to fall back on the high seas fleet, thus screening the Grand Fleet as it deployed. At the same time, Beatty's battlecruisers, which had sped ahead of the 5th Battle Squadron, returned to the fight in front of Hipper's battlecruisers, again forcing him to the east to prevent from being teed. Jellicoe, meanwhile, had advanced without any information on the location, course, or speed of the enemy fleet. At 4.51, Jellicoe had signaled the Admiralty that a fleet action is imminent. Goodenough signaled three times, at 1700 hours, at 1740, and at 1750, but his positions were obviously off. At 1755, Jellicoe asked the lead ship on his starboard column, the Marlborough, what can you see? It was only five minutes later that he learned that Beatty's battlecruisers were nearby, and thus that the high sea fleet was almost in gun range. It was not until 1813 that Beatty was able to inform Jellicoe as to the bearing, but not the course or speed, of the German fleet. At 1815, only a minute after the response from Beatty had been received, Jellicoe gave the order for the Grand Fleet, which had been steaming in six divisional columns, to deploy on the port column, that is the one to the east. Even before all the ships had acknowledged the order, the Iron Duke, Jellicoe's flagship, had put her helm over and begun the process of deployment. As the Grand Fleets deployed, several smaller actions were happening. Beatty took the rest of his battlecruisers, charging across the front of the Grand Fleet to take up the van. Wisely, Evan Thomas decided to take up a position at the end of the line. As this was happening, Hood came back into the scene and took up position ahead of Beatty. As Beatty charged across the front of the deploying Grand Fleet, however, two armored cruisers, the Defense and the Warrior under the command of Rear Admiral Arbonaut, charged the disabled Wiesbaden. This unwittingly brought them right under the guns of the German battleship. At 1820, the Defense was struck in the magazine by a 12-inch shell and exploded, taking all 900 of her crew with her. The warrior was also savaged by German ships, but a curious twist of fate spared her. As the 5th Battle Squadron had moved to take its place in the still deploying battle line of the Grand Fleet, it was still under fire from the advancing Germans. During the maneuvering to bring the squadron back into position, the Warspite had her rudder jammed to starboard, sending her in a long, arcing turn driving full speed towards the German line. The Warspite suddenly became the attention of German fire. Finding that they had been unable to free the rudder at the end of the turn, the only thing that could be done was to go again, as to stop meant certain death before the onrushing German fleet. At the end of the second turn, her rudder had been freed, and she was able to withdraw from the battle. This incident also ensured the survival of the warrior who had managed to limp away and saved hundreds of British sailors. Hood's battlecruisers, after taking their position ahead of Beatty, spotted Hipper's squadron and opened fire at 1820 at a range of under 9,000 yards. The fire of the three oldest British battlecruisers was rapid and accurate, with hits being scored again and again on the already pulverized German battlecruisers. Hood even shouted via voice to, to the gunnery officer of the Invincible, Your fire is very good. Keep it up as quickly as you can. Every shot is telling. The British ships were hidden by the mist, hampering the Germans' ability to return fire. At 1829, however, the mists parted and revealed the Invincible right in front of the Germans, silhouetted against the horizon. Quickly, the Lutzau and the Derflinger shifted their fire onto the Invincible, and in 1832, her Q turret was hit, and the disaster of the Queen Mary and the Indefatigable was repeated again. Of the Invincible's crew, 1,026 perished, and only 6 survived, including the gunnery officer. The sea where she sank was only 180 feet deep, so after splitting in two, she came to rest with about 100 feet of both bow and stern standing above the water. 
because of the damage dealt to the Lutzau, however, Hipper was forced to abandon his flagship to find another ship to lead from. As such, he transfers to a destroyer to find a replacement. Because of the damage sustained by his force and the pace of the action, it would not be until 2200 hours that Hipper would again be in charge of his force. As Sheer chased the 5th Battle Squadron north, it must have seemed as though a great victory was at hand. Here was a situation that Sheer and the entire Navy had been looking for since the beginning of the war. An isolated portion of the Grand Fleet had been caught by the High Seas Fleet. In their straining to catch the British, the lead Koenig class of battleships in the 3rd Battle Squadron, the best ships that the Germans had at the battle, had exceeded their designed speeds and miraculously maintained the range. Suddenly, out of the mist ahead, loomed the Grand Fleet. At 1817, the Marlborough opened fire on the approaching Germans, and after 15 minutes, firing became general as more and more ships came onto line and found targets. Even so, many ships were unable to find a target due to the mist. To the Germans, it, it seemed as though the horizon had become a curtain of flame, though the ships themselves could not be seen. The pressure from the weight of the fire was enough to force the head of the line to bend to the east following the battle cruisers. It was quickly evident that if Shear continued his course, the High Seas fleet would die then and there. His only option was to use a maneuver that had been often practiced in peacetime. At 1836, Shear ordered battle about to turn to starboard. Starting with the rearmost ship, the fleet came about 16 points to starboard, reversing their course. At the same time, German destroyers attacked but did not press home and laid smokescreen to cover the fleet. The turn was executed as if on parade and within four minutes the German fleet had appeared to have vanished to the shocked British sailors. After only 20 minutes, the Germans had turned tail and fled. At first, no one in the Grand Fleet understood what had just happened. It was not until 1844 that Jellicoe reacted. His initial response was a slight correction of course to the southeast. Then at 1855, Jellicoe changed course to the south, placing the Grand Fleet in a position to cut the High Seas Fleet off from their bases. At 1855, torpedoes reached the, British, well, the rear of the British line, hitting the Marlborough. Despite the damage, she was able to maintain her place in line. It is unknown exactly where the torpedoes were launched from. The Germans made, had made good their escape, though not without damage. Then, suddenly, Scheer again ordered the fleet to turn around at 1855. There's never been a, given a satisfactory reason for this move, but turn the fleet did. At 1910, the head of Scheer's fleet had was sighted again by the Grand Sea Fleet, and by 1915, the entire fleet had opened fire. Under the weight of fire, the cohesion of the High Seas Fleet started to disintegrate. The German ships attempted to return fire, but it was ineffective. Only the Colossus was straddled, and even then, only two shells hit home. Once again, the German fleet faced annihilation. To save his fleet, Scheer issued three orders. The first was for the battleships to turn about again for a third time. This signal was raised at 1912 and left up for six minutes before being hauled down the signal for execution. The second was by far the most dramatic of the three and was given at 1913. Schlachtcruiser ran an der Feind voll einsatzen. Battlecruisers at the enemy, give it everything! The third and final order, given at 1921, was for a mass torpedo attack by the destroyers. Following the order given, the captain of the Durflinger led the battlecruisers charging towards the British line at 20 knots. For four minutes until 1917, they pressed forward until a signal from Scheer allowed them to veer off. During that time, the battlecruisers were badly punished. The Durflinger was hit 14 times. The Lutzau was hit four more times, bringing her total up to a total of 24 for the day. Only the Moltke escaped major damage once again. The battlecruisers had done their job, however. They had bought the time that Shear needed to begin the battle turn. Unlike the previous turns, though, this one was far from a parade ground maneuver. Some ships turned to port, others to starboard. 
Some ships came perilously close to colliding with each other. A few final salvos were fired from the after turrets, though none came close to the British line. As a result of the second attack by the high seas fleet on that day, the cohesion of Shear's fleet was perilously close to evaporating. What saved the German Navy that day was the torpedo attack Shear ordered at 19.21 hours. When it came through, many ships were out of position and it could only be carried out by 14 ships carrying a total of 58 torpedoes. They came in three waves and were met by a hail of gunfire both from the secondary and main batteries of the dreadnoughts, plus fire from supporting light cruisers and destroyers. The first wave was able to press the attack to within 8,000 yards before launching and turning back, as was the second one wave, though it cost one of the destroyers. The third was forced to turn back before they were in range and retreated behind a smoke screen. In all, 39 torpedoes were launched at the Grand Fleet. In response, Jellicoe turned the Grand Fleet away from the incoming torpedoes and as a consequence away from the High Seas Fleet. Ten torpedoes ran out of fuel before reaching the Grand Fleet. The rest were skillfully avoided and none of the battleships were hit. In the end, Shear's second turn towards the D Grand Fleet, whatever it had been intended to do, had failed. No major damage had been dealt to the British and he had lost the remaining combat usefulness of the battle cruisers, suffered additional damage to his battleships, wasted many torpedoes, and lost a total of five destroyers. The final tor torpedo attack did do one thing of value, however. It forced Jellicoe to turn away, allowing Shear to disengage at a point when just a little more pressure would have caused the battle to turn to become a rout. While Jellicoe has been severely criticized, for turning away at that crucial mo moment, it should be noted that not only was this something that Delco had said that he would do in that type of situation prior to the battle, it was also the standard response across all of the major navies of the time. Hipper had done so earlier in the battle against a tor torpedo attack by Beatty, and even Beatty had done so during the Battle of Dogger Bank in response to the false sighting of a submarine. Thus. Jellicoe was merely doing what was standard practice said he ought to do in the face of a torpedo attack. The last act of, of the daylight battle was played out once again by the battle cruisers. At 2012 hours, Beatty suddenly found that his German counterparts just 10,000 yards away. Beatty's six ships opened fire and all four of the German battle cruisers were hit, the Lutzau having already been detached to live her way back to Wilhelmshaven. They were hit hard, but at 2030, the old pre dreadnoughts of the second battle squadron steamed into the fight, drawing the fire of the British battle cruisers. With the light fading and the battle cruisers having made their escape, the old battleships turned away and faded into the gloom. Beatty chose not to follow. As night closed in, the situation was as such. Jellicoe and the Grand Fleet stood between Scheer and his bases in Germany. Jellicoe had a higher speed, but the German night fighting capabilities were known to be greater. As such, Jellicoe was determined not to engage in a night battle, but to try and meet the High Seas Fleet at dawn. There were only two ways through the minefields that had been laid around the German close. One was the Horns Reef passes that the German fleets had come through that morning. While it was the closest to home, Shear would have to force his way through the Grand Fleet to get there, which Jellicoe thought highly unlikely to happen. A more southerly opening near Ems was considered more likely by Jellicoe, and after assuming night cruising formation with the light forces clumped together five miles astern of the battleships, Jellicoe ordered course in that direction. Shear, meanwhile, had chosen to make for the Horn's Reef Passage, and formed his fleet to punch through the Grand Fleet, whatever the cost might be. Shear knew that if he waited until dawn, that nothing would prevent the loss of the fleet. Shear placed the dreadnoughts that had seen the least fighting in the front, and sent the battle cruisers to the rear. In the confusing actions that followed, the Germans managed to punch their way through the light forces behind the British battleships, and through a surprising lack of initiative, Despite battleships being spotted, no information was passed to Jellicoe about this, and none of the British battleships opened fire when they spotted anything, which allowed the Sadlitz to escape back to port. The Admiralty had sent some messages to Jellicoe, 
but because of the false report that the High Seas Fleet was still in harbor, he was not inclined to believe them. One message that was not passed along, however, was the one that showed that Shear had asked to have Don reconnaissance by zeppelins over the Horn's Reef. Had Jellicoe been sent this, combined with the other messages sent him in the firing herd astern, he would have been able to piece together that the true direction of the High Seas Fleet was towards the Horn's Reef. If Jellicoe had been at Horn's Reef at John on the 1st of June 1916, it is hard to see how the German fleet could have survived the day. The battle ended with heavy losses on both the British side and the German side. The British losses were three battle cruisers, three armored cruisers, eight destroyers, lost 6,094 men killed in action, 674 men wounded, and 177 prisoners of war. The Germans had lost one battle cruiser, one pre-dreadnought, four light cruisers, five destroyers with the loss of 2,551 men killed in action, 507 wounded. While losses seemed to tell the story of a German victory, and it was loudly hailed as such in Germany, a closer look at what had been lost and the bound power after the battle tell a very different story. On the evening of June the 2nd, the Grand Fleet stood ready for sea with 22 of her 24 battleships ready for combat, and those losses were made good by the turn of ships from refit, plus the addition of three more Revenge-class Super Dreadnoughts. The German fleet had run to port and only had 8 of their 16 Dreadnoughts ready for combat. Of the five German battle cruisers that had fought at the battle, two months later only two were fit for combat, and one had been sunk. Again, ships from refit plus the new construction brought the British side back up to strength much quicker despite their heavier losses in that realm. Even more striking is the fact that some of the units of the Grand Fleet were hardly engaged at all. One in division, for example, only fired 34 shells in the entire battle, while another less than 200. When the actual tactical conditions are looked at, it quickly becomes clear that rather than winning a victory, all the Germans managed to do was avoid annihilation. Thank you very much for listening to this month's episode of Vox Oceanus. We hope that you enjoyed this. A quick announcement about the channel. Due to a heavier than anticipated workload, it has been decided that the channel instead of uploading monthly will instead be going to a bi-monthly schedule um, the promised episode on the galloping ghost of the java coast will be the next episode after this one and you can expect it at the end of july thank you very much for listening and have a wonderful day